I'd like to introduce uh, Rob Dewar, who um, is with the National Trust for Scotland. Um, he, Rob started his um, career with the National Trust as the Ranger for Conservation in the um, West of Ross. And then he was the Nature Conservation Advisor for about 12 years until he moved into his current role, which is as the invasive, I'm going to see if I can say this without tying my tongue, invasive non-species, non-native species project officer. Now try saying that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'd like to uh, hand over to Rob and if you could, uh, Rob, maximize your screen, that would be great so that we're just looking at the slides. I've entitled this talk, A Garden Within a Landscape, because the focus of the talk is about this National Trust for Scotland property in the magnificent and remote Westeros Highlands. The Trust owns this property because of the renowned Inview Garden. It's often featured in horticultural programmes and magazines, but what is less well known is it sits within two and a half thousand acres of diverse and wonderful landscape. It is also property where the Trust has been very active and progressive in conservation work. It is not only conserving the garden itself, but also the habitats and wildlife. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Logically speaking, the natural history of this state begins after the last ice retreated. From an NTS perspective, it really begins with this Victorian gentleman. Osgood Mackenzie, who crafted a horticultural wonder from this harsh environment. His daughter Mary Sawyer continued the work and eventually gifted the garden to the Trust in 1952. Osgood was very aware how the garden fitted into the landscape when he was gifted the estate by his mother. He had to use every resource available to heft out a garden from a wild remote peninsula. But today it's fair to say they're often seen as separate entities. Osgood also spent much of his time immersed in this wild country in pursuit of his favourite pastimes, hunting, fishing and shooting, and he was good at it. By the time Osgood was 10, he had caught a £20 fish and owned his own gun. These quotes are often used to make a very simple point that Victorians shot a lot of wildlife. The Victorian gentlemen used the language of vermin and prey, and Osgood certainly killed a lot of wildlife. However, Osgood was also a keen observer of nature. He wrote articles in field journals and observed details such as beetles preserved in peat. He asked questions that are only recently been answered. Over a hundred years ago, conservation was not a movement like it is today. Might Osgood even have been a conservationist if he lived today? One of the green lads. Most of the thousands of visitors that come to Inview Garden come to see this, exotic plants from all around the world and a very large collection of rhododendron cultivars. And only a few seconds away as the eagle flies is a very different scene. And this is why most visitors are in the area, to immerse themselves in the Westeros landscape with the exciting prospect of seeing some iconic island wildlife. We may be accused of overusing the word iconic, but Inview really does provide home to many of these animals and birds. Nature Scott have used these charismatic species to promote wildlife through the Big Five. But in a way more important than the charismatic creatures is the overall biodiversity. And an Inview Bioplips in 2013 recorded nearly 600 species at Inview. It's fortunate that we have accumulated a wealth of records and we have dedicated experts, recorders and local people that keep adding to this list. So what makes Inview so diverse? Despite its relatively small size in comparison with other NTS countryside properties, there is a real variety of habitat. And this aerial picture depicts that really well. We have the River U that flows out from Loch Marie, flowing into the Sea Loch, Loch U. Now we have this um, wonderfully indented coastline that surrounds the Inview Estate, providing lots of 
marine habitat, the seabirds and mammals such as otters. We also have a very sheltered little uh, Loch Turnig where we've got a, a resident common seal colony. We then have a variety of woodland. We've got the plantation woodland that we've inherited. Some of this is getting blown over in those gale force winds, but we're reconstructing that partly with regeneration, natural regeneration, but also planting. And this is going to form the basis of um, more native broadleaf woodland with Scots pine that will benefit the, the native wildlife. We have the inby fields, we have semi-natural woodland, and then we have this wonderful rocky moorland landscape dotted with its hill logs. The grass-roofed interpretive wildlife hide makes an ideal starting point as an introduction to the wildlife found in view. Young naturalists of the futures can look out to sea for mammals such as otters or watch birds on the salt marsh, all whilst being protected from the notorious island midges. The hide is one of the best places to see close views of green shank, around the time of the flooding and ebbing tide. These graceful wading birds pair upon the salt marsh in March and find breeding sites on the Inview bogland. The concrete used to be the menace of light sleepers, not so long ago, heard back in the 1950s, in the Inby fields. But the piping call of this bird can still provide a very early wake-up call in the spring months. You never know what you may see when you visit Loch Hugh. The white tail eagle is now well established in the area and a great conservation success story with around 150 breeding birds in Scotland and now spreading to other areas of the British Isles. Birds include great northern divers that seldom breed in the highlands but we often see mature birds in Loch Hugh in the early spring. This was a bird I had the pleasure of releasing after it had been nursed back to health by Beatrice from the Ullapool Animal Hospital. Here it's stretching its wings after a few weeks in a bath before it then lets out this amazing call of the wild. One of those special days. Sometimes we get the visits from suburban grebes in all their refinery just before they head to breeding grounds more centrally in the highlands such as uh, Loch Ruthburn. This is not one of my pictures and must credit this to Laurie Campbell, a wonderful uh, photographer. And then there are migrants passing through that keep us all on our toes, such as these Brent geese. Highland wildlife is not abundant, but it's tantalising and very rewarding when it reveals itself. The remote secret reaches of Inview Estate provide steeply wooded enclaves where hanging birch woods include plants such as hay scented buckler ferns, honeysuckle, and aspen and hazel have survived here out of reach from browsing animals. These sites not only provide damp undisturbed woodland where bryophytes and lungwort lichens thrive, but if you look carefully you can find signs of more active wildlife. We can spot the fish carcass in the last picture. Otters are not long-lived mammals in this harsh environment but thrive where they can use the shoreline to hunt for crustaceans and fish. They are not a marine mammal, so the freshwater pools we saw in the last slide are important to keep the fur in good condition. Road casualties are unfortunately too common, so we have worked with the International Otter Survival Fund, based on the sky, to place reflectors by the roadsides at otter eye level. This will hopefully give them enough warning if a car is passing. This loch may be one of the inland destinations otters are heading towards as they leave the shore. They may be searching for food such as frogs in the burns and loch margins. If they are hunting for fish in the loch, they will probably not catch the deep dwelling fish that only comes to the loch edge to spawn in the autumn. This is the beautiful arctic char with a bright red underbelly. It is close related to the sea trout but has been landlocked since the ice age. There is a wealth of wildlife under the surface we do not see, particularly in the ocean. 
research by organisations like the Fisheries Trust is so important and invaluable. Some of the correlation with sea lice and wild fish return to spawning grounds is alarming, but something that I hope politically, practically, we can eventually resolve. The river used the shortest, but was one of the richest rivers for sea trout in Scotland. At one time, six gillies were employed. That's more local workforce than a mechanised fish farm. So in my mind, it's vital we prioritise the health of the wild fish in the river systems. We really want the locks to be teeming with small fish to help these beautiful birds to thrive. If we may indulge in the word iconic once again, perhaps the divers of this claim more than most species found in the northwest highlands. The wild calls on a summer's evening height the atmosphere and are truly evocative of this landscape. Three diver species are found in the highlands and true breed regularly. This one is the red-throated diver, which tends to frequent the smaller lochans. Maybe the most striking is the black-throated diver. This frequents the larger lochs and occasionally breeds on views Kernsbury Loch. The loch is one of several designated as a special protection area for these breeding birds and includes my favourite loch, the most scenic and romantic loch, Loch Marie. Once again, credit to Laurie Campbell for these wonderful pictures. Divers are superbly adapted with powerful webbed feet for propulsion in water. They are not physically evolved to move well on the ground. Their breeding success is even lower than eagles, sometimes only one in four successful breeding attempts. Eagles find it tough when we have cold, wet springs, but the divers have another issue to contend with. Poor ability to move well on land means that they nest close to the water's edge. And water levels can fluctuate over three metres on Loch Marie. The Trust took part in a conservation effort to build rafts that fluctuated with the water levels. This doubled the breeding success rate. There are many such interventionist success stories like this in the conservation world, but it also begs the question as to how far do we go to help wildlife, particularly species that are on the edge of their global range. One of the threats that divers have to contend with is predation. One of the most ferocious predators is the pine martin. It can swim and it will take eggs. I've witnessed pine martins myself on a wild cam that we placed in a tawny owl box at Inbu. The little blighter took every egg one by one and it was tragic to witness this on camera, but it really is just the harsh reality of nature. We have since made the owl box pine martin proof and like all chicken coops in Westeros, it needs to be. You will probably know this is not a pine martin, but it is another ferocious hunting mustelid. It sees a flatter to its head, has a smaller white bib, and it is of course the North American mink. The mink is also a very efficient swimmer, predating on ground nesting birds and fish stocks. It can be a real threat to island bird colonies and cause devastation. Mink are particularly a concern if they find a water course where water voles exist and it can lead to the local extinction of this little mammal known as ratty in wind in the willows and of course water voles have become extinct in many parts of the British Isles and it's one of our most threatened mammals. I discovered a small population in view many years ago which at the time it surprised me is I tended to associate water voles with the lowlands. But I am finding colonies at really high altitude in the hills on slow moving peaty burns. Partnership work with CC, Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, and the West Ross Fisheries Trust and local gillies has resulted in monitoring, trapping and dispatching a mink as they disperse. And here we can see one of the mink monitoring rafts that we place in the burns to detect if we have mink in the area. Once we've detected them, we can then put in a trap and we can look to trap the mink 
and dispatch them. We've done this uh, at various periods and in view we caught three mink in a really short period during the time of the dispersing in the late summer. And that was quite a success. It's also quite alarming that they, they keep moving into the area. Is it really realistic to control or eradicate such species? We have some protection of the in view water voles which may prevent a local extinction. But how much resource do we put into this unless it is really on a landscape scale effort? One of the most successful examples of invasive non-native species control, probably globally, is this Hebridean mink project that commenced just after the millennium. Here they set up uh, thousands of traps. They used uh, a team with dog handlers and um, it was an incredibly successful. But is it feasible to control mink on a national scale out with these islands? If we go back to the amount of vermin control taking place in the highlands pre-war, then with a concerted effort, perhaps it is. We see the south facing slopes of Loch Kerntheri. It's called Leathe Darach in the Gaelic language. And the Gaelic language is a wonderful way of learning what the landscape looked like and what people did in the landscape. It's very descriptive. So Leathe Darach means slope of the oak. It has well drained and more fertile soils conducive to woodland establishment. There are indeed a few small oaks. It is also a hot spot botanically with fragrant orchids, gentian, mountain everlasting and melancholy thistle. It is a great place for butterfly transects with speckled woods, scotch argus, common blue, green streak, small heath, large heath butterflies growing on the wetter bogs and the day fly moth argent and sable. The habitat is a mosaic of birch trees with open bracken sites where violets also grow. These are all ingredients to host one of our most beautiful species of butterfly. It's the pearl border fertility, or is it the small pearl border fertility? They're very similar, but the pearl border fertility is on the wing a little earlier in the spring, but there is an overlap in flight period. Past ranger records describe seeing this butterfly in early May at this site in the 80s and 90s, but since then only the small pearl border has been seen. It could be that this is an example of local extinction, but we can only hope it's still hanging on and keep looking on those sunny days in early spring. This is the same slope looking seaward with birch woodland expanding naturally. But if you look on the shoreline, you'll see a much older tree, a mature tree that's uh, just been out of reach from browsing. If your winter tree ID is pretty good, you might have guessed what it is already. Shape does not look quite right for a birch, which is shown in leaf. But take a closer look in the foreground. This is an aspen tree that has suckered from the mother tree by the shore. Aspen was something of a forgotten tree, but in recent years, conservation work led by organisations such as Coli Alba and Trees for Life have really raised the profile of the tree. They've established nurseries such as the Trees for Life and Vega nursery, near the propagating from rootstock and using techniques to encourage these nursery grown trees to set seed. The Trust at Inview Garden have joined forces and working in partnership to collect seons from trees in our locality in the Northwest Highlands. Here you can see the collection of seons, which are the very terminal parts of the branches on the trees. We then carry out the very delicate process in which the seons are carefully grafted to rootstock in order to create trees of local provenance. This is one of our volunteers carrying out that uh, very careful task. We now have our own nursery in view, paid for by our 
NTS American donors and looked to eventually plant out aspen at sites in West of the Ross. The years when aspen is in, in flower is a rare event in Scotland, but when it does happen, it coincides with long hot summers. Aspen grows often grow from single drop clones, sometimes suppressed for many years by browsing. If you reduce this browsing, they can burst back. But if we can also plant new aspen, we can increase genetic diversity and the chance of flowering in future years. It's cutting edge conservation work. In the view, amongst a few select ecologists, is rebound for these magical pattern bogs. The small example is what occurs on a much bigger scale in the flow country. We think they are formed by the process of slope and hydroscopic pressure. But I don't want to delve deep into the science. And I used to say on guided walks, perhaps some things in life are best kept a mystery. And it's a really good way of getting out of an awkward question. What we do know, of course, is the value of our peat bogs for carbon capture, slowing down water flow and filtration of water. It's what we're now increasingly hearing as an ecosystem service. And it seems that the flow country may soon be a world heritage site, which is going to be really fantastic news. The Trust is restoring degraded peatland on some of our large upland properties. As for in view, they're already largely pristine and unaltered in thousands of years. One of the few examples of a truly natural habitat. Not only do the peat bogs provide an ecosystem service, but also a specialised habitat for some mesmerising dragonfly species. And in view as all three of the northern bog pool specialists. It took a long time for us to know this, as the warm summer days without much wind are not that common in view. And it's not easy to identify fast flying dragonflies on the wing, but we do have other ways to survey. We know we have 14 species of dragonfly and damselfly in view. I think this is more than any other NTS property. And one of the ways in which we can identify them is by using a white colander and trawling the sieve through the peated loop. Dragonflies can live in the larval stage for three or four years in the cold conditions of the north. They are ferocious hunters in the larval stage just as they are as adults. You can see this black torpedo shape. This is the azure hawker. But as fascinating as larvae are, I still prefer to see the adults. And one fine spring day, the smiley individual, Azure Hawker, decided to pay me a visit. My lucky day. Look into the eyes of the white faced darter, and you will see this lovely white mask. It's very rare in England and localised in the Highlands. It likes the small sphagnum filled bog pools, of which we have a good supply at Inverview. In some years, when the rivers are low, I've felt the mossy substrate crunch under my feet. I can see the bog pool shrinking. I find these dry periods unnerving in this part of the world. Could climate change have an impact on species such as whitefish data if the pools begin to dry up over long periods? It could be many, one of the many species that struggle to adapt. The final dragonfly. I will mention as part of one of the northern specialists is the northern emerald. It is one of several emerald species. They're all very active and difficult to photograph. One distinctive feature are these bewildering green eyes and if the sun catches it right you see a lovely green metallic sheen to the body. I happen to identify a freshly emerged northern emerald in view. It was in the early morning and it was still warming and pumping blood into its wings ready for its first maiden flight. Back in the sphagnum gloop, we can find three species of sundew, round-leaved, oblong-leaved, and great sundew. And they even hybridize just to confuse issues. 
These are carnivorous plants gaining nutrients from the live capture of insects. Inview also has all the native carnivorous plants known to grow in Scotland. Both species of butterwort, the common butterwort, and the less common pale leaf butterwort, and the aquatic bladderworts, which catch insects underwater through suction. If you walk out to these wild, lonely lochans, look into the depths. Ancient pine stumps that have been radiocarbon dated conclude that Scots pine began to die back around 6,000 years ago in many areas of the far north. This is the climate became wetter and the peak began to form. Here is myself doing a depth probe with my dad's old chimney sweep rods. Peat forms from decaying sphagnum at around one millimetre per year. So these rods told me that there was 5,000 years of peat accumulation on this bog system. This is again working in partnership, this time with an academic institution, the University of Stirling. They're providing us with further evidence to show what the InView historic landscape looked like. Polyanalysis, or palynology, is a powerful technique employed in the reconstruction of past human settlement and land use. A peak cart in view was taken from the depth of a hill lock and the layers analysed through a microscope. Peak preserves well in the anaerobic conditions. This is something Osgood noticed all those years ago. So pollen grains with a tough exterior can be identified to tell us what was growing in the immediate landscape at any given time. This is a crude reconstruction indicating a mosaic wooden landscape with wetter areas of bog and open heathland. Southwest Norway has a similar climate and geology to Westeros, and this scene depicts the same mosaic landscape of woodland, scrub, wet and dry, and heath that the palynology work was suggesting in views landscape looked like. This Norwegian landscape is as a result of 50 years of land abandonment and animal husbandry. And this is what a lot of our upward landscape in the highlands could look like with a relaxation in browsing. InView has over 50 archaeological sites recorded. This is an example of an archaeological palimpsest, a settlement on the InView Peninsula. There are houses, enclosures, lazy beds where potatoes would have been grown. There's also an Iron Age roundhouse at a time when corn would have been grown rather than potatoes. Identify pollen in the peak cores can tell us when humans lived and when they abandoned the area. A window to the past. Today in view, crops are being grown in the form of fodder. All farmers are encouraged to intensify agricultural production after the war. And our tenant farmer has done the same. He's done this by draining fields, reseeding with ryegrass and chemically fertilising to increase yield. This produces high nutrient rocket fuel for his cows, but it's not great for biodiversity. So we have reversed this process several years ago by reseeding 10 acres of imbi fields with a specially chosen meadow mix. There are over 30 species in that mix that still provide a fodder crop. The end result has seen a reduction in yield but greater insect diversity. The farmer commented, what have you done with my nice green grass? But he also said the cattle like the fodder and possibly the high mineral content associated with the meadow grass. I think the most important thing we can do in biodiversity conservation is improve habitat protect and enrich, enrich ecosystems. The InView meadows are a, a small example, but if that could be done on a wide scale across the farming landscape, what a difference that could make. We don't have to de-intensify all farming ground, but maintain a connected landscape for biodiversity, would redress much of the loss we have witnessed since the war. Bats are really good indicators of a healthy environment with lots of insects. And we've got four species in view that we know of. 
we have both species of pipistrelle bats, which can be found right the way up as far as the Shetland Isles. We have the brown long-eared bat that's sometimes known to, as the whispering bat because it has a very faint echolocation when we try to pick it up on our detectors. We've also got the Debenton's bat, which hunts and skims over the water surface. We cannot observe bats that well, so to understand more about them, we have to listen to their language of echolocation. Now we've conducted a landscape scale study working with Echoes Ecology, and these are bat consultants, but we've also trained our own volunteers to use bat detectors and carry out citizen science surveys. And these are developing a better picture of how the bats are utilising the Indian landscape. If you just lend your ears for a few seconds, let's listen to the, the super fast sound well of bats as they echolocate. We just heard a bats gaining a picture of their surroundings through their ability to echolocate. They've actually got better nocturnal vision than humans, but it's this extra superpower that enables them to precisely home in on prey. And what we heard there were calls giving the bats a picture of all the features such as trees, hedges, buildings, and that rasping buzz you heard. That's the sound of a bat as it catches a midge or some type of insects. It's starting to echolocate at high speed so it can really focus in on what it needs to catch. And also there was a chirping sound. And that's not echolocation. These are actually bat social calls. And bat experts are now trying to study these so we more we understand more about these these wonderful bats. So we're actually listening there to one bat talking to another bat. So we're constantly learning about these intelligent and marvellous mammals. So here we are looking at the Imbai fields with a nice edge habitat, loved by bats. And the woodland is a mix of trees planted as part of the historic design back in Osgood's time, but now largely managed to become continuous cover. Native broadleaf woodland with a mix of Scots pine this woodland, along with a few exotic trees in the garden itself, is an ideal habitat for one of nature's big five. One that has been largely missing from the Northwest Highlands during recent decades. Or at least until now. And it is, of course, the red squirrel. I'll explain why it's swimming very soon. I'm sure you're all aware of the plight of red squirrels and the action to save red squirrels through grey squirrel control programmes and habitat management. The greys have been outcompeting red squirrels for, for many years and it's caused the extinction of reds in many parts um, of the country, particularly in England. But the greys outcompete the reds for, for food but also they carry this terrible um, virus, the squirrel pox virus, that um, doesn't kill the greys, um, but if it's passed on to the reds, it causes this dreadful death of the red squirrels. But the NCS became involved by participating in one of the first red squirrel translocation programmes from strongholds in Moray and Strathspey over to the west coast of Scotland. This has happened at two of our properties, Balmacara and Inview. And it's been done under a Nature Scott license given to Roy Dennis. Roy Dennis was uh, very instrumental in bringing back the whitetail eagle many years ago, and he established his Highland Wildlife Foundation. 
So Roy and I met in view and I had three main questions. Would red squirrels damage the garden? It was important to reassure the gardeners that the, the garden wouldn't be damaged in any way. But ecologically, was there enough quality habitat and enough food? And also was woodland connected enough? As in view is quite isolated in regards to its woodland um, with its connectivity within the landscape. In view is separate from Loch Marie woodlands by the River U. But have you seen for yourself, if a squirrel is determined enough, they will find a way. After meeting with Roy, I was convinced enough. So following Nature Scott's translocation guidelines, we went ahead. Here we are taking delivery of the red squirrels. We have Roy in the background there and one of our volunteers. And there's uh, myself and Aidan putting up the, the boxes and the feeding stations that we put out just to help the red squirrels get a good start uh, at InVU. And they have settled in well with dray sites being identified and lots of evidence of feeding and occasional sightings. We've also done some camera trap survey work that has revealed how the pie martins and red squirrels are using the feeders at separate times of the day. And it's interesting to hear now that uh, as pie martins are moving out from the original stronghold in the northwest, they're beginning to move into different areas of woodlands further south. And where the greys and reds coexist together, the pie martins are sort of redressing the balance. The grey squirrels are not really evolved to, to, to cope with uh, pie martins as a predator. And they're disturbing the grey squirrels activity a lot more. But the red squirrels are adapted and they're able to, to live alongside the pie martins perfectly well. So it's good to see that uh, nature is sort of redressing that balance. The translocation of red squirrels is, is relatively easy conservation work to achieve. But some conservation work is less easy and it demands a lot of time, resource and effort. It's not the rewilding process of bringing something back into the ecosystem, but taking something out that really damages the ecosystem. This brings me to my last subject this evening. And when I look at this picture, it causes me to question why I evolved into an invasive species project office. I must like a challenge in managing this particular species regarded as the most invasive non-native terrestrial plant in Britain is one of the biggest land management issues we face. When I began with the trust, I worked with volunteers to cut down great walls of rhododendron ponticum. We built fires and we finished the day with toasted marshmallows. We did make massive inroads to a problem that has spread out of the garden, where it's initially planted for shelter. And even Mari Sawyer regretted using this plant. Since that time, we've learned an awful lot. We use targeted techniques such as stem treatment, we have engaged with communities to carry out plant swap schemes. We've held workshops for landowners and contractors. It is important to explain and sometimes win hearts and minds with any conservation work. And this is particularly the case with invasive non-native species control. We realise the task of controlling inns on NTS estates overall would mean a concerted effort. So grants were obtained mainly through the People's Post Lottery but also the Nature Scott Biodiversity Challenging Fund. And this is what's paid for Project Wipeout. Inview has once again been groundbreaking as Project Wipeout has paid for a special kiln to produce biochar. So we are turning what was once a problem into a solution. And this wee film will show you what that's all about. Invasive rhododendron is something we can control. But some things are not in our hands, such as disastrous events like the big storm of 2005, when we lost hundreds of trees in view. Many specimen plants were destroyed in the garden, 
we were cleaning up the debris for weeks. This really is guarding on the edge. What we can do is manage invasive species, improve soils and work with nature to provide a resilient shelter belt. This will protect the garden and also benefit wildlife. The garden with the landscape is sometimes at the mercy of nature, but respecting, understanding and working alongside nature will benefit us all. I've only touched on some of the nature, wildlife and work going on at InView, but I hope it will offer you a flavour of the conservation work the Trust is carrying out and also how we work in partnership. If you haven't visited Westeros or InView, um, I would urge you to do so. It's, we get a lot more visitors now than we used to. Um, but it's still a, a wild and beautiful place to relax, watch wildlife and just lose yourself in the environment. I'll leave you with this one last thought and I thank you all for listening. Hope you approve and support the trust work at InView and all of our properties. And I'm happy to take any of your questions. Uh, I've got a few questions for you, Rob. Um, Great. Already I'll, come back to the, I'll come back to uh, the first question uh, a bit later on, but um, uh, you talked about mink being an invasive species, and the question was, are beavers becoming the same? Um, no, uh, although some land managers might feel that way if it's not, uh, if it's threatening what they're doing with that land. So beavers are a native species, so um, or they were a native. Um, they were driven to extinction through persecution, but they were only here a few hundred years ago. So we're bringing back beavers. Um, some people might consider them a problem if, for example, they were flooding areas um, that could be damaging crops or potentially um, beaver felling trees that uh, in orchards or something like that that people didn't want. But overall, um, what we're hoping and I would say this as a conservationist, is that beavers are going to do a lot more good for us than any damage. And I think it's just a case of working with them and accepting that the wetlands that beavers produce is going to be more beneficial overall for flood, pre flood prevention, greater biodiversity. So um, they're not invasive. Uh, it's just learning how to live alongside them again. Okay. Um, right, I've got a few questions about trees. I'm going to see if I can uh, put a few of them together. Um, uh, two of them, actually two questions, you could probably answer the same thing uh, with this one. What's special about aspen trees in our environment and, and why are they so important? And I suppose uh, one of the questions I, I think related to that was somebody was asked, are there any types of trees that deer will not eat and destroy? Deer. Yeah, uh, good questions. I think, um, I think what's special about aspen um, really is, it probably isn't any more special than any other our native trees. We don't have many native trees. Um, when some of them are under threat, like ash, for example, you know, it, it's sad to see because we don't have a lot of native trees. But I think, the, the focus on aspen has been that it, it's just one of those trees that seems to be forgotten about a little bit. Um, certainly recent decades, until till about now, the last, last decade or so, um, I think it's been forgotten is because it's largely gone from the landscape. So if it's special, it, it's special in the sense that it's, um, it's become quite rare. Um, that's because it's particularly palatable um, and it won't survive where you, you have a heavy browsing or grazing. So the livestock and deer impact over the years has meant that aspen is really only surviving in little enclaves along coastal areas and little craggy outcrops that, where it's protected. But it also does harbour specialised um, invertebrates and species. Um, so it has a special quality in itself with associated um, insects and invertebrates. Okay, um, there's another tree one about oak. Um, is any planting of the oak being done in the area? 
um, that used to be full of oak trees, or is it just hoping yeah. that it would regenerate? Well, interestingly, we, we started um, creating charcoal from, from the rhododendron, and then we moved into biochar, um, which is a, a really better quality um, charcoal. It locks more carbon. And we had a news um, item about that saying that um, charcoal making returns after 400 years. And a lot of the oak in the area had, had been felled um, for the production of charcoal for the iron industry within that locality. So um, a lot of the oak has gone, but um, we are planting oak in the view. Um, we're trying to create um, woodland that is uh, birch and Scots pine with pockets of oak in the more sheltered fertile areas. And I would like to see more oak out on the wider estate where we think it might survive from the browsing. Um, so again, it's a good question, conscious of what we've said in the talk. So there is oak conservation work. It's just um, getting it in the right place where it's going to be protected. We, we don't want to plant too many fences. We don't put too many fences up, but the far end of the peninsula is fenced off because it, it took very little fencing to basically um, block, uh, eliminate a lot of browsing on that peninsula, but the soil isn't suitable everywhere. Okay, um, got just one more question on um, trees. Should we be planting aspen in our garden? I'll be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody is a lover of aspen because it, it suckers out and it will perform, it could create quite a the grove, a little mini woodland in itself. So it's maybe not one of the best trees to manage. Um, okay. But depends how big your garden might be. <laughs> okay, um, now down to some animals then and wildlife and such like. Um, one question or a couple of questions about lynx and pine martens. Where would lynx control the pine martin and do you have uh, uh, do you have many, do you have pine martens? Uh, do you have many uh, pine martens? How many do you know are in the area? Yes, the, the area around Westeros, the Northwest Highlands was the last stronghold for pine martens. They were persecuted during the Victorian period. They were called sweet mart because they had a very um, uh, non-pungent or if you like pleasant smelling fur. So they were often used by the Victorian ladies for shawls and different things. So very sought after mustelid um, for, for its pelt. So that helped eliminate a lot of pine martins from vast areas. Um, but now, of course, they're protected and they're beginning to spread out of that core area, which, mm -hmm. um, which NBU was in. And as you're probably aware now, they're coming to England, they've um, been translocated, I think, as well into parts. So they're, they're now starting to spread right across the British Isles. The interaction with other animals is an interesting one because I think that's something that we're, we're probably still learning a little bit. You know, what, what would be the impact of lynx on, on the small deer? They, they certainly would predate on small deer. I don't think they would manage to have much impact on pine martins. I don't know that they would be particularly interested yeah. in, in pine martins. They're probably, I think the pine martin would be to in tune, being a predator itself, I don't think the lynx would be able to creep up on it yeah. somehow like it would a deer or a sheep. <laughs> uh, staying on wildlife like that, uh, do we have a deer issue at Inview? Uh, yes, those areas that I focused on, on Leothidarach, where the, the birch trees were starting to spread out a little bit, it would probably be nice to have more trees there, but we, we haven't decided to go down a fencing route at the moment. So, Deer would is the main thing that would impact on that woodland expanding further. Um, as, as you saw, there is enough woodland, there is some woodland, but it has the potential to be a lot yeah. more wooded. And without further deer control, that would be limited. But we do also um, cull deer within the woodland closer to the garden itself because they're causing a little bit of damage within the woodlands. But don't forget that, that deer are a natural woodland animal. So we'd like to get the balance right so that woodland um, deer, both red deer and roe deer can exist to some extent within the woodlands. Okay. 
Uh, again, still sticking on wildlife. Um, somebody would like to know how you access the uh, wildlife hide. It's they know the garden the well, but um, you know, how do you access it? Yeah, it, it should be open all the time. When we first built it, people said um, they warned me about the youngsters coming in and uh, using it as a bit of a, a den or whatever else or, and causing vandalism. In all the years, we haven't known any of it, fortunately. So um, it, uh, it should be open for you if you do visit in view. Um, please go in, um, sit there and just enjoy the atmosphere. Okay. Right. Got a couple of questions for you and uh, squirrels. Sticking on the wildlife still, or the animal life. Um, I'll start with the short question, then go to the longer one. Okay. Is it right to trap and kill large numbers of grey squirrels, as they do in Dumfries and Galloway? Mm. And I'll, I'll, I'll just keep on going with this one. It's, uh, it's also, cons somebody considered, or was, was once told that, relocating squirrels was very stressful mm. and it was said in support of killing any of the greys that were trapped rather than transporting them to an area where there were no reds do they suffer do the reds suffer in the process of relocation mm. so a oh, couple of questions or a few questions there about reds and greys and transportation and relocation and yeah. stress and all the rest of it on the animals no, all, all fair questions. I, I think, you know, in the conservation world, you know, I was questioning there about how much you intervene. You know, I threw that question in halfway through, you know, philosophically, how much do you intervene to redress balances, to, to correct things? You know, the grey squirrels, certainly in our urban parks, give people a lot of pleasure. Um, you know, I think there's areas that you would, um, we, we probably wouldn't aim to try and eliminate Grey squirrels, um, but I think if we are looking to save the red squirrel, um, you can justify the the trapping and the effort that's gone into that on that basis. Otherwise, you lose the red. Um, but then it, it's open to people's opinion. Then they, they might decide that um, the grey squirrels uh, they have to somehow live alongside each other. Unfortunately, the impact of the greys, particularly with the squirrel pot has just been too devastating really to allow for that. So I suppose that that's where the translocation um, measure is a good one in that it, it creates an area with a gap from the greys where you can just then hopefully stop greys moving into that region. Um, stressing with the uh, translocation, um, you know, you, you could say this with rhinos and all sorts of conservation work where you you're transporting animals from one place to another. I think they probably would be a little bit confused when they arrived. Um, the journey itself was relatively unstressful. They're in a box. They, it's quite dark. It's quite settled in that, that environment within the box, relatively short journey. And um, I think once they're released, the habitat was healthy and um, and conducive to red squirrels so they would soon settle in but I would respect people's opinions if they felt differently that it was too stressful on certain animals. Yeah. Okay uh, a non-wildlife question who are your American donors? Oh that's the um, we have members in the, the, the members of the National Trust for Scotland um, but American members so they 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 come together, we, we sometimes ask them to finance certain projects and they, they kindly uh, dip into the pocket. So that's great. Okay, right, coming to a question, I don't know even what the question is about. <laughs> Have you had any Phytophorthora ramorum? There you go, that's another mouthful for me. Do yeah, you still really. test for it? So hopefully you know what it is knowledgeable yes it's a rather nasty pathogen um yes uh in view garden has been hit uh two or three times with that uh, I, I didn't have time to mention everything in 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 this talk this evening but um that that hit, has hit the garden we've had to remove uh areas of larch um i think because of the ponticum have become such a problem not only 
for threats to the natural habitat in the view, but also the garden itself. It was, it was swamping large areas of the garden that were not necessarily the shore garden, but essential parts of the shelter belt. Um, and that created damp conditions um, that I think um, perpetuate that risk of the pathogen spreading. And that's where we found the outbreaks. It's been in these very dank, permanently dank areas where the, the mature rhododendron has, has invaded. So in some ways, it's um, it, it, it pushed the agenda to try and get as much of the ponticum out. Um, really all of it out, except for the very essential shelter mm -hmm. that we manage. Um, it speeded that process up. Uh, hopefully we've seen the back of it. Uh, we've got biosecurity measures for it to try and not to come back in again. Um, we've had to sort of burn areas and we've lost some valuable plants within the garden as well, some specimen cultivars. So a very knowledgeable audience tonight. Yeah. yeah. Um... Back to another, I've got another question here about regeneration in the birch and the aspen. The question was, um, how did you manage to reduce the browsing pressure on them? Um, that would be referring to Leotid Darach, I think. We, we've, where we have regeneration, we've, we've done it in two ways. One was to fence off the peninsula. And that's helping with the reconstructing of the woodland. We inherited plantation woodland, lodgepole pine. We want to gradually convert that to native woodland, broadleaf woodland along the fringe with some oak, Scots pine and birch and hazel, which will all help with the squirrels. Um, then the other way we've, we've managed to get some regen is a little bit of um, uh, culling of the deer. But that's mainly protect the present woodland. So a lot of the deers coming in from the larger letter you estate, um, that's a little bit out of our hands. We don't really have stalkers at Inview. We employ uh, someone just to do a little bit of uh, calling where it's needed. Yeah, okay. Um, any advice on bracken control? Yeah, um, it, it's something we've managed around the archaeological sites. Um, if you remember in the talk there, we, we've got a lot of archaeological sites. It seems to attract bracken. And I experimented, if you cut bracken back to at least twice a year, ideally three, it weakens the, the rhizome. It needs to store its energy in, in the rhizomes. And if you knock it back as it regrows, you knock it back again, then ideally two or three hits a year and it starts to reduce its energy. And within five years, you can reduce the, the, the amount of bracken to something like 10% of its original biomass. But that is quite a, a sustained effort. <laughs> um, that's the only way of doing it. You could roll it. You could um, sort of get machinery and, and start to roll it, which essentially does the same thing and keeps compressed, knocking it back. Or you're then left with azulops, which is um, a nasty herbicide, um, and that does work. But of course, um, you're then having to use chemicals. Okay. Um, another question about invasive species, ponticum. A uh, question here is the fact that it's a big exercise, clearly, at um, NVU to get rid of uh, ponticum. Uh, but what's happening throughout the rest of West of Ross? Because there's a huge amount of it elsewhere. So what's what's to be done on non-NTS land is the question. Yeah, well, we, we've done our bit on our properties and we've also done a lot, I think, with, with PR. I work with the um, Saving Scotland's rainforests. Uh, you might be aware 40% of the Scottish rainforests are under threat with rhododendron ponticum. Uh, pockets within Westeros and of course, Argyle as well is a, another bad area. We think there's possibly over 30,000 hectares, I think, of rhododendron threatening our what's left of our native woodlands. So it's a, it's a big question. It's a very important question. It's really how much... Um, it's partly to do with policy from above. So the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy acknowledges that invasive species are one of the biggest threats to biodiversity. So we're having 
an acknowledgement that's already there. It's then putting in resource and grants, but also enabling landowners to um, give them the whereabouts, the, the ways to, to deal with it, um, but possibly having more jurisdiction through regional strategies, um, regional programs, regional targets to try and eliminate the rhododendron. But it costs an awful lot of money. It's very time consuming. And you've got to, again, sustain long-term management to really see, um, see the job being done successfully. It's moving in the right direction, I think, but, but quite slowly. Um, yeah, I, I've, there is one question here from uh, somebody in Tinnebrew um, who's got 12 acres of purple rhododendron in, the, in their ancient woodland, which has kind of taken over the whole forest floor and stops anything growing. So how can they manage that? Yeah, they, they say, I don't know where you've come across the um, Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest, that there's a lot of partners, we're, we're one of them. And one of the things that we said from the outset is that we've got to get the Scottish rainforest as it's now been termed, but temperate Atlantic woodland, Scottish rainforest, um, unique, unique habitat um, really in the west of the British Isles. Um, and the reason it's called Scottish Rainforest really to raise the profile of it, to influence politicians, to really to get behind on seeing how valuable and how threatened this habitat is. So if there's any encouragement, I can see in the next, next year or two, certainly more resource, perhaps a dedicated grant just to get rhododendron out, out of those main areas. So your question of there. I'd be hopeful that there is a grant and a resource available coming up fairly soon to deal with specific areas where you have a particular, particularly if it's a very good rainforest or very good woodland environment. Okay. Um, two other short questions. One ask, uh, somebody asking, is it possible to come and uh, get involved in volunteering at InverU? Yes, it, it, it would be. We can either do that through the National Trust for Scotland's um, CV groups. Um, there's a Highland one, if you're based in the Highland region. Um, I, if somebody wanted to get my email, I could pass you a contact on. Um, within InView itself, they have quite a lot of local volunteers. So they have people that live there and every week they're helping with, with bracken, gorse management, um, roadie work, et cetera, building footpaths. So if you live close to Inbu, just knock on the door. Otherwise, look for a Highland um, or look for a conservation volunteer group, and it would need to be the Highlands for Inbu, ideally. Okay, and I think we've got the the last question is a personal one. What brought you to Wester Ross? Ah, oh. <laughs> um, just a very enticing range of jobs. Um, that involve working at not only in BU, as you can tell, uh, very close to my heart, um, but Torridon and Corrichola. So when that range of job came up, uh, it was just too much, too, uh, too tempting. And somehow there's always a bit of a calling. Um, I've Scottish blood. I always felt I wanted to come to Scotland at some point, studied at Stirling University. Um, I've always loved the mountains, so the Torridon Hills and the uh, west coast up there was just too, too much of a temptation. So that's where I ended up for eight years. Okay. Well, those are all the questions that I see on the Q&A. Uh, Gillian, do you any other questions that you see? Uh, I think I think we're we're just past nine o'clock now, so we're we're probably yeah. best to wrap up anyway. But thank yeah, you very much for so many questions. Thank you very much indeed, Robin. Hopefully, you'll see more visitors coming through in for you as a result. <laughs>